Thank you, George. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. I have so many friends here, I'm finding. I, I'm so impressed and happy to be here in Miami. The perfect weather, the perfect architecture right now, the committed people. You know, I can't tell you from, uh, as an observer from New York, getting, off, getting into LaGuardia Airport and then coming out here and seeing how well you are doing. And then last night meeting you and the delegates who came internationally and today seeing this parade of flags, the statistics. Miami is up a billion dollars. Everyone wants to be in Miami. It's incredible. But I'm here to talk about change, how cities change. You are at a moment of beauty right now in Miami. But remember that no city ever stays the same. It either gets worse or it gets better. So I would like to talk about the tools of getting better, the tools of changing cities, and specifically the tool of urban design. I was so fortunate to be the chief urban designer for New York City under a period of real growth under Mayor Bloomberg. But urban design is not very well known. I'd like to tell you a little bit about it, what it is. Because urban design is not urban planning and it's not architecture, it's somewhere in between. You see, we're the ones who hold the pens. All around us are swirling the forces of changing cities. In this picture, there's the chief strategist, the chief economist, the community liaison over at the Department of City Planning, but we're the ones holding the pens, drawing what the future will be like. And there are a lot of great designers in New York City, but they aren't urban designers because to be an urban designer, you've got to be able to work under the pressure of politics. You've got to be able to understand the profit motive. If something isn't profitable, it won't get repeated and cities grow by repetition. And then you have to be able to design at the same time that these pressures are on you. Because you are not designing a fantasy, you are designing a reality. And that's the definition of urban design. Now paradoxically, even though we work at the scale of cities, the smallest details matter. Here are my staff measuring a curb in the Bronx. You know, if you get the details wrong in your city, it's like getting the details wrong on your phone. You know, it, it's the user interface. Public space is a user interface and it has to be perfect. To get it perfect, to get your public space better, you've got to do something that I encourage all of you to do, and that is to draw. How many of you have sketchbooks? Good, I see a few hands. Everyone should draw because, you know, a photograph isn't enough. All of us today have been taking photos. And that's great, but the photo stays on your camera. It doesn't get into your head. The drawing, there is something about the act of drawing that will bring what you are drawing inside of you and make it a part of you. And when it comes to public space, that's how you're able to transmit what it is that you love about a place to others, is by getting it inside of you first. So you don't have to be Michelangelo. Stick figures are okay. But if it's worth remembering, it's worth drawing. Okay, and then here's probably the most important lesson about changing cities, that's listening. This is a picture of my, my former boss, Amanda Burden. She's one of the most powerful, wealthiest, beautiful people in New York. Her stepfather was the head of CBS. She's grown up at the epicenter of power. But as chair of the City Planning Commission, she would listen. And this is her listening in one of 100 public sessions we had to talk about a new waterfront plan. And this act of listening by the powerful is what builds trust. And it shows a respect for everyone. And without that respect, without that trust, you can't have a dialogue. So the act of listening really is critical to urban design. Now, our agenda, when I was, when I was brought into the Bloomberg administration, I was given a, an agenda which is to improve civic life by improving public space. 
This is kind of interesting, this, this picture. That's my daughter, Lelia, when she was three years old in Paley Park. It's a teeny tiny park in midtown Manhattan. You should go to it. It's an oasis with a little waterfall. It's, an, it's smaller than this room, but it's mesmerizing. And my daughter understood that. And what's interesting is that Amanda, when she, it was her stepfather, Bill Paley, who built this. She learned about public space by making this great small public park. And it transmits forward. So there's a generational lesson here. Now, I know this is, this may not, uh, uh, I'm a professor at, at, at times, so you'll have to indulge me some, because I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history lesson. I wanna give a very quick, very brief history of urban design in New York City. Okay, and it begins with what's called the Commissioner's Plan in 1811. That was the plan that took Manhattan, which back then was just the lower part, the tip of the island. And a group of people got together and realized Philadelphia was beating New York. Philadelphia was growing faster. And New York wanted to do something about it, so they decided to use urban design to plan the city and they covered Manhattan with a grid of streets. It's the same grid of streets as there now, 60 feet wide, all the numbered streets going up, and then 100-foot avenues going north-south. It's a good plan, and it stood the test of time. Who would have thought that we'd have grown into it? But do you see anything unusual about this plan, anything that seems wrong in the commissioner's plan here? There's no central park. Now the commissioners, they wrote a little report to go with their plan. And they said, people will ask, is it not strange that we do not have a great public space? But land being so dear in Manhattan, in New York, we thought, they thought, that the public space could be on the riverside. And you know what, they even, they said, our rivers are like oceans compared to those tiny things called the Thames and the Seine that Europe has. And they're right, the Hudson River is big. The East River is big. And writing in 1811, no one could imagine that that would ever change. The rivers actually didn't get smaller, but they forgot one thing. Or they, not that they forgot it, they could not have anticipated it. Now, digress a second. Do you all know who Cornelius Vanderbilt is? Was the richest man in America, the man who had the Grand Central Railroad. I believe he built a few hotels here in South Florida even. Well. Back in the early 1800s, he would, his job was a ferryman. He would row people from Staten Island to Manhattan and earn a little bit of money. And he realized, you know, this is really hard work. <laughs> it's gonna be really hard to make money doing this. And right about 1825, 1830, he and George Stevens and another set of New York inventors we're looking at adapting the steam engine to ships, to boats. And the little Juliana was the first steam-powered boat. It wasn't any bigger than the stage. But that's what the commissioners didn't realize, that when you put steam to boats, boats would be able to tie up anywhere on Manhattan. The, the tides of the East River and the Hudson are too strong. They call the Hudson the river that flows both ways. So sailboats can't make it efficiently to dock anywhere. But with steam, anyone could go anywhere. Vanderbilt bought a lot of land on the west side of Manhattan. He even built, a few years later, a railroad for that land. And by the middle of the century, there was no more public space in Manhattan because all the coastlines had been privatized. They had turned into this incredible, uh, horrific mix of glue factories and brick kilns and workers' houses, and it was just chaos. And the only place you could go if you were a worker on your one day off on Sunday, if you wanted some little bit of greenery, was a cemetery. And that's what brings me to my first great hero of New York urban design, Frederick Law Olmsted. He's the guy who designed Central Park, but he's the guy who figured out how to pay for it, and he's the guy who figured out the politics of how to get it built. And that park, change New York. You know, one of the political hur hurdles he, f he faced was that people said, oh, this is a park for the rich. You know, you build this park, they're just gonna race their fancy carriages around. And 
That's true, actually. But when the park was built, it turns out that watching fancy carriages race around is a lot of fun. So it drew both rich people and poor people. It became a democratizing force in the 19th century New York in a way that no other public work could do it. It's an example of public space increasing and improving the quality of public life. Well, New York grew, of course, got richer and richer, uh, became what was called the capital of the 20th century. And the 20th century, though, from urban design point of view, began with a crime, an urban design crime. Have you all, I'm sure you've been to Lower Manhattan, to Wall Street. Well, a block away from Wall Street on Pine Street, you can go there today and you'll see a building called the Equitable Building. Handsome enough by our current standards, but what was strange when it was built in 1911 is that it went up 54 stories with, on every inch of its property. Now, what happened is the other people around that building, and these were not naive people, these were the titans of Wall Street who owned that land, realized that they had been robbed, that this building had robbed them of their light and air. And they did something that Wall Street never, ever does. They asked for regulation. And that regulation ended up in the 1916 New York City Zoning Code. It's my favorite piece of planning zoning um, documents. It's so simple. It says, if you're gonna build a building in New York, you can go straight up from the street, but only to a certain height that's a multiple of the street width you're on. After that, you've gotta angle back until you hit 25% of your land, and then whatever you want, sky's the limit. This very simple rule created some of the best buildings the world's ever seen, the Chrysler Building. For one, the Empire State Building, incredibly beautiful buildings. But I'll tell you, and when I worked for Senator Moynihan, my office was right there on the 62nd floor of the Chrysler Building above the Eagles. By the time you get up that high, the floor plate's too small. It's one half this room. So that brings me to my second hero of New York urban design, this guy, Robert Moses, the power broker. Now, he was the man who broke all the rules. He's the one who had this, he was never elected to a single post, but he became the most powerful person in New York City. His trick was to never give up the, the head of an agency that he became. He started out as being the parks commissioner. He kept that. Then he became the bridge commissioner. He kept that. The roads commissioner, he kept that. He amassed all this power and was able to create huge things. He broke the mold for New York City and got, got it to be the size and scale that would compete in the middle of the late 20th century. Um, he was pretty much all powerful. Um, I, planning in New York in the 1950s, Senator Moynihan, who I, I used to work for in Capitol Hill when he was young, was an aide to the governor of New York. And he told me that this was how planning went. Robert Moses would come into the room with a manila envelope with a bunch of projects written in pencil. He'd hand them to the governor, cross his arms, sneer, and leave. And that was it. <laughs> they get funded. So this is the guy who built highways through old neighborhoods, who tore down blocks and blocks of New York to build huge public housing. Um, and he was unstoppable. And in the 1960s, he proposed to build yet another highway, and this one would be across Manhattan, across Lower Manhattan, across Greenwich Village. Now, you've all probably been to Greenwich Village. Do you know how beautiful it is? Um, and that's where we meet my third great urban designer hero for New York City, which is Jane Jacobs. Now, he was planning to build this highway through Jane Jacobs' neighborhood. She was not all powerful. She called herself a mom with big glasses. But she organized her community, and she fought Moses. She stopped this highway. And if you go to Greenwich Village, stop by her bar, where the, ta the White Horse Tavern on Hudson Street, where she used to meet her neighbors, have a pint of beer for her and remember her. But she became the woman who finally stopped Robert Moses. And this is something interesting historically. Uh, the year 1961, that was the year that Jane Jacobs, with a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation, published The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Have you read that book? Anybody here read that? It's a, it's a wonderful book. It's a good read, but it became the Bible of community planning. 
But that was the same year that Robert Moses was able to change New York zoning from my favorite 1916 beautiful building zoning to the 1961 New York City zoning resolution which we have today, which made as of right all the things that it, it used to take his muscle to do. Towers in the park, parking regulations, floor area ratios. This document revolutionized New York City zoning and it, it's just always funny how in history these two things seem to happen at the same time. So that battle of Jane and Bob they both eventually died, but that battle stayed on. And you'll see if, you, if you're a geek for public administration, you can see the laws change in New York City in the 1970s and 1980s, the establishment of community boards and various other legislative means. Bottom line is that that battle became codified. It became part of the process of how we make decisions in New York City. It became what's called the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, ULERP. And this is a chart of ULERP. It's mind-numbing. <laughs> and I'll be doing a workshop later on in the afternoon to, to, to show you the good things about it. But it's easier if you just think about it this way. It's kind of a conga line. It's some, any project that's deemed big enough to be significant in New York has to go through this process. And it never comes out the same way it went in. Because it goes through a series of top-down and bottom-up comments and changes until it's finally approved by the city council. And if you look at our land maps of, of New York City over time, you'll see how this feedback loop, how this ability to change constantly is able to make finer and finer grain fabric. And really, any neighborhood in New York, there is so, there's so much richness to it. Whether it's my neighborhood of Red Hook, Brooklyn, or Midtown Manhattan, it just getting more and more complex, not complicated, complex, rich. I think that's a good thing. So let me give you a concrete example of urban design. Um, has anybody here been to the High Line? Ah, oh good, okay. Well, remember that railroad that Commodore Vanderbilt built in the, uh, on the west side of Manhattan? That ran for almost 100 years at grade, and it ran right by 10th Avenue which was called Death Avenue because so many people got run over by the railroad. So it was actually a Robert Moses project to help get money from the federal government as part of the, during the Great Depression, to build some new infrastructure, to take this railroad that was at grade, lift it 20 feet into the air, make it four tracks, build it into buildings, the most incredible technology um, and to solve this Death Avenue problem and to make this manufacturing district work. It worked fantastically for about one generation. And then, just like the commissioners never foresaw steam power, well, the people who built this never foresaw that manufacturing would leave Manhattan, that trucking would take over rails. And by the 1980s, it was just abandoned. And a bunch of very smart people researched this and realized that, aha, this isn't really legally a railroad. This is a tube of space. This is an easement. We can buy the land under it. We can petition to have it torn down and the easement removed, and then we can build five stories of manufacturing use in Manhattan, which is not bad. It's not the best use, but it's pretty, pretty good. We can make something out of nothing. So they petitioned to tear down the High Line. Now, thanks to um, the ULERP process that I was telling you about, before tearing it down, they had to have a public meeting. And at that public meeting, two guys, Josh and Rob, not planners, not architects, not politicians, met. And they were in the neighborhood, and they'd always seen this strange thing. And they said, like, wow, we, we shouldn't just tear it down. There's got to be something better for it. And they formed, at that meeting, something called the Friends of the High Line to try to figure out what to do with this old piece of infrastructure. Meanwhile, the clock was ticking, and the mayor was going to, Mayor Giuliani was going to destroy this. But luckily, Mayor Bloomberg came in before it could be taken down. And Mayor Bloomberg made Amanda, who was a friend of the High Line, the head of the planning commission. So Amanda told the planning department, find a way to save this. And the way they did it is actually, I think, a paradigm for how we should approach almost all change 
in large cities where there is great demand. The first rule is that if you want to save something, create a district around it. So th this is, uh, in other words, don't fixate on the object. Think how what you are going to do will transform what's around you. And then be clear about your objectives. We wrote down these objectives to transform the High Line into a unique linear park, but also to provide more housing in the neighborhood, to preserve even a piece of the arts district that had grown very well in the old manufacturing, and to encourage mix of land uses where before there was only one. And then what's interesting from urban design was to ensure that the buildings that were planned around the High Line as a park would preserve the light and air to it. So you can see the previous zoning, it's all manufacturing here. And this is the way we, we changed the zoning. We created a special district around it. We mapped residential at its perimeters. We kept the old gallery district in the middle. And then this was the, the trick that changed the enemies of the High Line into the friends of the High Line. All those people that had bought the land were still trying to tear this down. But some of the old hands at the Department of City Planning remembered a technique called transfer of development rights that was used to save Grand Central Station a generation before that. So the trick that worked, the thing that made the politics and the finance and the design all come together was this idea that you could declare a High Line Transfer District and allow that transfer district to sell its air rights across to the new residential on the perimeter. Now what this did is it took somebody whose land was worth five stories of manufacturing if the High Line were torn down, and it turned it into five stories of residential on top of towers if the High Line stayed up. You can't believe how quickly it changed and how the enemies became friends and the, the speed. Um, it's actually good to see, if you go and research the records, I mean, it's literally minutes after this passed that people were down at the deed office effectuating the legal documents to transfer the rights. Anyway, it worked great, but let's go back to the design a second. How should buildings, if we turn this into a park, what should the buildings around it be like? How do we know? Well, you had to draw. We drew to see what it would be. Should they touch? Should they not touch? What's the right way of the buildings to approach the High Line to, in, to make it better than it is? And we came up with these, uh, they're called bulk envelopes. They're a series of rules, algorithms, call them what you may, that shape the buildings. So that if private money came in and wanted to build one of these buildings, they would be built in a form that had already been calculated to keep light and air and views to the park. And if you walk down the park now, you get the benefit of that bulk envelope. Here's, here's a specific example, 23rd Street. Um, the green is where you, you could have built something if the Highland had been torn down. But what happened instead was that that was transferred over to the top of a Jean Nouvel building on 11th Avenue. And here's a diagram. You see that site right there in the middle at 23rd Street on the High Line. Now, it could have been built five stories, but instead, those air rights, part of them were used on site right next door, and what was left over was then transferred over and across to the built-up district. So what you got was a beautiful building by Jean Nouvel, a very, very handsome building by Neil Denari, and the, the funding and the maintenance and the economic development of this new park. I think it's a big success, but today you can't really call urban design success, at least in my book, without satisfying my three heroes. So no matter what you do in a city, I want to find out what did Robert Moses think? What did Jane Jacobs think? What did Frederick Law Olmsted think? What would they have thought? Well, Moses would have been pretty impressed by the numbers. He would have loved the amount of development that came in. On the area immediately adjacent to the High Line alone, over $3 billion of private money came in for a $100 million public investment. That's a 30 to 1 ratio. That's better than Lehman Brothers. He would have been amazed at the amount of jobs that this created. And this actually led to the Hudson Yards, which we won't talk about just now, but that's another $10 billion. However, what Moses would have, as much as he would have loved the scale, he would never have believed that two guys, just two neighborhood guys, could have started something this big. That the community 
could have had a bottom-up approach that would have resulted in something of this scale. And Jane Jacobs, well, she would have liked the galleries, she would have liked the outdoor cafes, she might think it's a little too rarefied, but she would enjoy the fine grain of it, but she would never believe that government could ever write regulations that would allow such fine grain. And then what would Olmsted think? You know, if you've been to Central Park, you know how good that is. You know the Rambla there. You know, you know the, the vistas that he creates. Well, I think if he had walked on the High Line, he would love this too. But he'd think we're crazy for building it 20 feet in the air. And that's what brings me to a conclusion that I think is as valid for a project anywhere, is that if you want to succeed in urban design today, you've got to have the quantity of Robert Moses, you've got to have the quality of Jane Jacobs, and you're going to have to incorporate the nature of Olmsted. I think if you put those three together, you will succeed. Now, I've told you the how. I've kind of laid out how zoning is a tool that can turn demand into positive change. But I think we have to step back a moment and think a little bit about the why. You know, I said earlier that um, no city stays the same. No matter how good you are, how good things are right now, unless they get better, they will get worse. The other thing about cities is that you never know what's gonna hit you. You know, all the planning that we do today, we really don't know what's gonna happen in the future. Think of those commissioners back in 1811. Would have had no idea about steam engines. And now, I think we are coming into a, another period of uncertainty, where we don't quite know what tomorrow will bring. I'll give you an example. It was actually this day, wow, this is the anniversary. This is the anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane, now when was this, like six years ago. So, I live in Red Hook, Brooklyn, which is coastal, low-lying Brooklyn. And six years ago, I heard on the, on the news that a Frankenstorm was coming to New York. And, you know, I, in my role at the Department of City Planning, I'd done a lot of theoretical planning for what happens when hurricanes hit cities and critical infrastructure and this and that. And I'd even gotten a grant from the, the Rockefeller Foundation to write a book um, about cities and, 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 and change. But, wow, I didn't believe this. I actually had, I had a motorcycle back then and I'd actually taken it up and, because I thought it was winter time. I didn't know that we're still gonna have hurricanes. And we just sort of denied, denied, but then it was upon us. And I actually defied the evacuation order and stayed in my house in Red Hook to just experience what it would be to have a major storm hit a major city. And I'll tell you, it's pretty humbling. Apart from being stupid, <laughs> you shouldn't do this, but you know, if you're the chief urban designer, you can, you know, whatever, it's business related. But anyway, um, you know, it, it, I, I remember as the water started rising, okay, I put on my boots and my snowmobile outfit, I, got, I wanted to go outside and kind of see this, and as I opened the door, it was late autumn, so all the leaves were golden. And they just kind of flowed in as I opened the door. And I thought, oh, this is actually kind of beautiful and poetic. And then, <laughs> and then boom, you know, the, the transformers started going. And I realized, oh my god, you know, the electrical panel's in the basement. I don't want to be anywhere near this. So I, I went upstairs and, you know, tried going out on the roof, but it was just the winds were, were too high. So I just stood by, a, by the window and, and watched, looked outside at Van Brunt Street. And you know, the water, it wasn't a tsunami like in the movies. It wasn't drama. It was water that rose, but it rose so fast that you didn't have time to think. You know, you'd see like, oh, okay, I, I see hubcaps. Then you don't see hubcaps. Then the, then the car's gone. And you, at some point, see that the buildings end up looking like boulders, boulders in a, in a river. And it's all brown, and of course, there's no light. You just realize that, wow, as big as New York is, 
the Atlantic Ocean is bigger. And it's a very humbling experience to me. Um, but, of course, the good news is that New York is above sea level. So when the tide went out, the waters went out. But the bad news was the recovery and what that does to you. You know, what those billions of gallons of water, the, it's not fresh water, it's salt water mixed with sewage. What they do to your, your infrastructure. <clears throat> and I actually left city planning and went to be a professor, thinking that maybe science could help us here, that um, I went to something called the Stevens Institute of Technology, which is on the Hudson River. It's, um, it's actually where the little Juliana, where the steam engine was invented uh, by the person who founded that technology university in the 19th century. But anyway, they, I went there because they had the best hydrodynamics, the best sensors in New York Harbor. And I thought that if we combined urban design, hydrodynamics, and complex computational modeling, maybe we could solve the problems. So I did that, and I kept feeling something wasn't right. You know, all the charts and all the data we would make would tell you that something, the cities should be going down, that the, the science tried to return to some percent of function in some unit time. But if that happens over and over again, you go to zero. But cities never go to zero, historically. And I was wondering what, what that was, and I, I couldn't figure it out until something happened completely unrelated to my teaching. And that was my mentor, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the senator. Um, this, there are no more senators like him. He was a senator who, for a vacation, would go to write books. He was a Harvard professor who gave up tenure to run, run for Senate. He was an incredible thinker. Anyway, he, he was a person um, that had decided that he wanted an architect on staff. He was the only person on Capitol Hill to have an architect, and that was me. And um, I w was fortunate in ways that I didn't know un until actually he died. He died rather suddenly and unexpectedly. Um, and we were going to have his, his memorial service at the Syracuse University School of Public Service, where, where he had learned and um, been a student. When I was this architect for him on, on Capitol Hill, you know, I, I was, my title was advisor. I was the advisor on environment and public works. But I, I was the one getting the advice. And Senator Moynihan would love to talk about cities. And he's the person who taught me that you've got to combine politics with money and with design, all three, if you want to make anything happen. He also liked to say that cities never lie. You know, 100 years from now, when people look at our cities, they will see ourselves. Not what we pretend to be, not what we hope to be, but what we were. They're a very accurate record of what we can do. When we, other, all the other staff, you know, for healthcare and, and foreign relations, they would have to wait in line to give memos outside his office. I would get a call to go out to lunch, you know, meet the senator at La Bra, at La Brasserie. And um, any time we'd have these conversations there about, about cities, and any time I would say something vaguely intelligent, he would say, ah, spoken like a true Athenian. And because my mom is Greek, I thought this was just like a, you know, like a comment on, on my heritage. But it, it had nothing to do with that. And I didn't realize it until his memorial service in the School of Public Service, where I was waiting, I got there a little early, and I was waiting in one of the corridors that he would have walked through every day. And I looked up on the wall, and I saw in, chiseled into the wall something called the Oath of the Athenians. And I read it, and then that's when I realized what I was being taught all these years. The Oath of the Athenian has three parts. It's what someone who came of age in ancient Athens had to swear to, to be a citizen. And it was simple. It said, one, revere the gods. Two, obey the laws. And three, and this is it, leave the city better than you found it. That's the one 
rule, the one thing that keeps our cities alive. That's why they don't go to zero. It's because everyone, if everyone who is a citizen thinks, how can I leave the city better than I found it in some way, that city will get better and not worse. So that is our challenge today. Government is kind of broken. There are no Senator Moynihan's out there anymore. And I wake up and I think, well, how can we make our city better? What? I don't, I'm not in government anymore. I don't have the tools that I had. Bloomberg's not in power right now. How do I, as a citizen, make it better? What scale can I do? And I think that's a question for societies like yours and international societies, is in this new era, we're on our own, and yet the challenges are getting bigger. New York's not the only place that's going to get hit by a hurricane. There are challenges we haven't even thought of. So I would ask you, and this is what I'm learning by meeting you all, is how do people who love the city, like yourselves, who are a part of the machinery of the city, how do you come together to make it better than you found it and leave it not less than but greater than it is today? I don't have the answers other than I know that they are inside you. So I thank you very, very much for having me here today. And it's both an honor and a pleasure to be in this beautiful city. Planners, politicians, and private interests, politics, finance, design, they've got to come together. <sighs> Frankly, I, I think zoning and planning is the instrument of aligning those forces. I think that very often planning departments don't understand the, the politics side or the finance side. And I'm hoping that there is a way that the people who do understand the, the finance side can come into the discussion with a public agenda, with a positive uh, agenda. So, again, no, no answers here, but I, I see an opening for those of us and the, who understand the financial mechanics of building. You know, because there is really nothing more expensive than building. Maybe war is more expensive. Destroying is more expensive. But building, there is the amount of capital needed to create a city like Miami, um, a city like Dubai, a city like Singapore. How to concentrate that capital is is a question that, if it's not answered, there's not going to be any city. So I think we're emerging from a past where financial interests were only considered negative, the sort of the, the Jane Jacobs end to that, where all the developers are considered self-serving. And I think we're entering into a time where we have to think of ourselves as more than just a single developer. I'm, I'm sorry, this is perhaps too long an answer, but now you've gotten me thinking. <laughs> you know? I think uh, something like this topic of resilience. You know, right now, everyone who talks about it, it sounds like a negative. It sounds like, oh, I have to raise my foundations. That's another so many million. Can resilience, can building parts of a city in a way to protect the rest of the city, can that be? profitable and make great public space and create more public housing and more opportunity? Can we turn this project of the next challenge into a project of building the next neighborhood, the next city? Can we view it positively somehow and embrace this challenge rather than retreat from it behind a budget? Yes? public transportation and traffic, Miami's got big problems with that. Yeah, my, I... What are successful cities doing? Okay, that's a very good question. My, my good friend Patricia today told me that her 40-minute drive was an hour and a half this morning. If you've ever been on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, <laughs> I, you can sympathize. Well, look, I, I get to work all over the, the world in cities, and um, we have many friends from Sao Paulo here. <laughs> 
which is not the model for transportation. <laughs> and I don't think we have anybody here from Singapore, but Singapore is the model of, of transportation. And they have something called integrated land use planning. In other words, they treat land use and transportation as one. That's something American cities don't, don't do. You know, we've got the DOT and we have the planning department. You've got to bring those two together. Because what I found that's interesting about Singapore is that it teaches you that it's not just a single piece of infrastructure, it's building a network that changes over time. So Singapore, right after independence, needed to develop fast, so they built highways. But they saw very quickly that those highways were gonna just, the congestion would have been gridlocked for the whole island. So then they started building the subway stops. But they did that coordinated with the highways. They left land available for subway lines. They created new villages so that when the highway use went down, the subway use went up, they would already had the land use around the subway stop ready and not too much for the capacity of the roads built in the previous generation. And now, what I work with them a lot on is, okay, what about the next step? You know, you got the cars down, you got the mass transit, what about the walkability? Ultimately, the greatest form of transportation is walking, is pedestrianism. And it's really hard to do well. It's my big, one of the most things I'm, things I'm most proud about in New York is that we do walking well. And um, Singapore's got to learn that, and of course, they, you know, climate's extreme. But there are probably a few lessons for Miami here. And maybe, maybe it's a balancing act here that somehow to, okay, combine more transit with just the right amount of roads, but also bring in the walking, and I guess there are now scooters and electric bikes, there, there, there are more modes coming. But solving that last mile and you do it not just by building stuff, you build it by land use. Um, so, yes, there. So how we, as a leader in uh, real estate, can start that conversation? What is uh, your suggestion for this Latin American country that, you know, zoning and politics is in other influence, let's say? for zoning and a lot of things that, but we know, I mean, people that uh, internationally, we want to have better cities. Mm -hmm. How can we um, add value to that conversation in our countries? Let, let me use the, maybe the example of Sao Paulo, because I know Sao Paulo more, more in depth than I know other, other cities. And Sao Paulo has very bad zoning. This, this sort of limited floor area ratio, this idea of building walls, garages as they call them there, and a successful big development will be multi-acre, multi a few towers in the middle, some private gardens and a wall around the thing. Not good from, from a city. So what can a private sector do? I think the private sector has to work on retrofits, I think the private sector has to break the rules a little bit. I think the private sector might even do something that might be seen as against its interest in the short term. But real estate, you know, it's the most conservative industry in the world. A developer says, you build something successful, and a developer will come up and say, I want it to look just like that, only cheaper. <laughs> it just happens over, so once you build something, once you prove that it works, other people will follow. So my hope is that somehow in Sao Paulo, somehow in the chaos of government, somehow in between the cracks of the regulation, somehow in the power of the capital that is there, that a private sector will lead a project that's a model for how the city should build, and then that model will get repeated. The laws will change to meet that model. Thank you. Let's hear it for Alexandros Washburn. Outstanding. Thank you.